I'm Barry Eichengreen. Uh, I'm a professor of economics and political science at the University of California at Berkeley. Maybe I should start by uh, explaining why I'm here, um, how and why I got here. I'm not a technologist or a blockchain enthusiast. Uh, I'm actually an economic and monetary historian by profession. Uh, much of my work has been on the classical or 19th century gold standard. You all will probably know that there's something of an affinity between gold bugs, enthusiasts of the, uh, of the gold standard, and uh, stablecoin blockchain bugs. Both have something of a libertarian streak, I think. Both believe, not entirely accurately, that the gold standard operated like a private money with limited government uh, involvement. And they see an analogy between a dollar that was once pegged to gold and a stable coin that might be pegged to the dollar or to another uh, major currency. So the fact that I've worked on the gold standard led me to be invited to lunch, actually to uh, a series of, of lunches at excellent San Francisco restaurants with the funders and founders of uh, prospective stable coins. I first thing I noticed was that I was the youngest person at the table. I was the oldest person at the table. Sorry about that. By like 30 years, looking at the program for this conference, I see that um, history repeats itself in, in, in that respect as well. Uh, I explained that I was skeptical about the stablecoin idea. I was skeptical that uh, uh, a private label stablecoin, a private label dollar would be uh, viable. Uh, my conclusion was that my luncheon companions knew all about blockchain, but they didn't know very much about monetary economics, uh, which is what I do. Uh, if you know monetary economics, you'll be familiar, for example, with the literature on currency crises or on speculative attacks on pegged exchange rates, including successful uh, speculative attacks on gold standards, on gold exchange standard systems. So I asked my luncheon companions, are you familiar with the literature on speculative attacks on, on pegged exchange rates? And they responded, what's that? Uh, so hence, hence my skepticism then, which uh, I, I uh, retain now. Uh, I think uh, this more accurate historical an uh, analogy between speculative attacks on currencies and gold standards in the past with stablecoin schemes today leads you to the conclusion that uh, stable coins are either fragile, they're prone to attack and collapse if they're only partially backed or collateralized with actual dollars or, or uh, dollar bank balances, or they're prohibitively um, expensive to scale up if they are in fact fully or over collateralized. So um, that brings me to uh, Facebook's private label stablecoin, uh, known to us all as Libra. I was skeptical about the viability uh, of Libra when the original proposal was floated more than a year ago. And as I said uh, a few moments ago, I remain skeptical. Now, uh, there is a new Libra white paper 2.0 that was issued uh, back in April of 2020, and it, it filled in many of the blanks in the original uh, white paper. But I think blanks and ambiguities remain that, again, uh, lead me to the conclusion that this scheme is never going to get off the ground. So the problem with uh, Libra 1.0 was pushed back from regulators, financial regulators around the world who worried about whether it would uh, create financial stability risks, whether it would undermine the effectiveness of national monetary policies 
Uh, a few of those concerns have been addressed, others not, but even the ones that have been addressed, the way that uh, um, Libra's architects and backers have attempted to, to address those problems, I think raises as many questions as it answers. So what does uh, White Paper 2.0 uh, say? Uh, number one, it replaces uh, the original Libra, which was essentially pegged to a basket of different national currencies with a, a, a set of separate stable coins, one of which would be pegged one-to-one -to, -one to the dollar, one of which would be pegged one-to-one -to, -one to the euro, one of which would be pegged one-to-one -to, -one to the yen, and so forth and so on. That does address the issue of who would ever want to use this thing. Nobody actually wants to do transactions in a basket of currencies. If there were a demand for such a thing, some clever investment bank, JP Morgan or someone like that, would have uh, uh, constructed and marketed the basket long, long ago. But there could conceivably be an interest in, in, in using a stable coin uh, that is widely used by other people and pegged one-to-one -one, uh, to the dollar among residents of the United States and other people who presently use uh, U.S. Treasury-issued uh, dollars. So uh, I, I, I think that's a small step forward in, in, in terms uh, of viability. We're also told that uh, Libra will be uh, fully backed. Uh, its reserve, made up of cash and short-term securities, will be held by a, quote, network of well-capitalized custodian banks, and there will be designated dealers who will commit to making markets with tight spreads. In other words, buying and selling Libra for, in our case in the US, actual dollars uh, at a price that barely deviates uh, from one to one and they will interact both with retail customers like you and me and with the Libra uh, Association, which will uh, burn and uh, issue uh, the Libra. Uh, units. Um, so I think that uh, in, in, in principle solves, the, addresses anyway, the take-up problem. Other problems, uh, not so much. Um, previously, uh, it w so the, the white paper, um, let, me, let me put it this way, uh, a, 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 a problem with these uh, single coin uh, units is that they will circulate in the countries in question. Uh, Libra dollars will circulate in the US, but they can also circulate in, in other places as well. So the danger of what monetary economists refer to as currency substitution, I think is very real that people in Argentina will move out of pesos and, and into Libra dollars if the regulators there if the central bank of Argentina allows them to do so. So you can see where this is headed faced with the danger of loss of monetary control, inability to conduct monetary policy, inability to use the resources of the central bank to help finance the government when governments do in fact need finance. Uh, the regulators there will try to prevent uh, uh, shifting into uh, Libra dollars. That's problem number one. Problem number two, I think, has to do with uh, uh, the source and the structure of the backing for Libra. So now Libra is supposed to be 100% plus backed. Who's gonna, gonna pay to accumulate all the dollar bank deposits that back Libra? Uh, people who purchase uh, Libra units are going to have to give uh, the Libra Association a real dollar in return for a dollar's worth of Libra. But this thing now is going to be more than fully backed, more than 100% backed. Somebody is going to have to put up the residual, whatever is over and above that 100%. That may be uh, financed by the fees 
that the Libra Association finances uh, for its transactions. But as you know, the higher the fees, uh, the less the use. So the fees are going to be kept low, and I think that will raise questions about the adequacy of the capital buffer. And there are lots of technical details that financial regulators worry about having to do with capital buffers. Do they uh, move in a pro-cyclical or counter-cyclical way? Do they amplify or moderate the business cycle, the financial cycle? The Libra Association, they're learning monetary economics as fast as they can, but they don't address these issues in their new white paper, I think because they haven't really uh, absorbed their importance yet. Um, there is the problem that uh, uh, Libra doesn't have a forward market. So the idea at the moment, I mentioned it before, is there will be these entities called designated dealers who will be responsible for intervening in the market, buying and selling Libra, so that its price doesn't deviate from $1. The problem is that the designated dealers, think of them as narrow banks, will only have so many resources, so many actual dollars to use in those stabilizing arbitrage transactions. If there was a forward market where you could um, say, if the, if the price of uh, Libra US dollar rises above $1, uh, uh, the dealer would uh, um, be able to uh, sell Libra US dollars on the spark market for $1 and buy it back at the forward price tomorrow. And if the forward price is exactly $1, as it should be if this thing is stable and credible, then this arbitrage, this spot market, forward market arbitrage, will push the price back to $1 where it belongs. Moreover, if th this forward market existed, other people besides the designated dealers could engage in these profitable stabilizing transactions. So every currency that is successfully pegged or kept stable around some target level uh, that's done through operations on the forward market, and uh, the Libra bros haven't figured this out yet. Finally, I think there is the problem that there is no Libra lender of last resort. Um, the Libra Association talks about smart contracts in Libra dollars and, and, and so forth. What that means is they anticipate correctly, I think, that an ecosystem of derivatives, uh, other types of securities based on Libra will grow up around the actual uh, token or currency unit. Uh, the problem with derivatives markets is that uh, they can be illiquid. Everybody can line up on one side of them and things can go wrong financially. And the way actual uh, currency markets deal with this, actual financial markets deal with it, is by having a central bank that acts as a, a security buyer of last resort in times when liquidity is lacking, as the Fed did in the early stages uh, of the pandemic, when it bought everything that moved that was denominated in dollars. Libra needs a central bank, in effect, if it's going to um, if the, the markets that grow up around it are going to be stable and uh, national governments are going to be queasy about the creation of a private Facebook uh, owned and, and operated central bank. Um, there is talk hidden in the Libra white paper about instead using gates rather than having a lender of last resort. They're just going to prevent you from selling your Libra or selling your Libra-related derivative securities, your smart contracts, at those times when everybody lines up on one side of the market. And who exactly, uh, Calibra or who, is going to make those decisions? 
that you're not going to be permitted to sell what you own for actual dollars is not clear either. So uh, there are some very big uh, uncertainties, I think, that would have to be resolved in order for this uh, creation to get off the, the ground. And my conclusion remains, some of those problems are insoluble. Libra is an interesting idea that will never see the light of day. So what will uh, see the, the light of day here? That brings me to the uh, official alternative, which is a central bank digital currency, uh, a, a digital unit, a digital account, a digital wallet, a digital token that would be issued by national central banks like uh, the Federal Reserve System or the European Central Bank or the People's Bank of China. A first observation about this would be that the Fed already has digital dollars. It already has digital accounts and does digital transactions with the private sector, but it limits who can open those accounts and who can do those transactions to regulated commercial banks. Uh, so the CBDC debate is about whether the Fed should provide those accounts to other entities whether, for example, it should provide retail accounts to others, including to individuals like uh, you and me. So uh, I think the most likely scenario is one in which we all would be allowed to have a pro an individual account with a Federal Reserve Bank. This idea came up again in the early stages of the pandemic. You may recall that the U.S. Treasury had great difficulty in actually getting $1,200 checks to individuals, not all of whom uh, had a file with the Internal Revenue Service, not all of whom had a bank account. So how would they figure out how to actually get a check to everybody else? And it took them many weeks in the midst of serious economic and financial distress for them to be able to solve that problem. If we all had an account at a Federal Reserve Bank, they could, could have just credited all our accounts with a $1,200 deposit done. Um, so I think this idea is going to come back. Uh, I think it's less likely that the Fed in particular will move in the, in, in, the direct, uh, in the direction of doing transactions in digital dollars with e-wallets, uh, issuing tokens, and the uh, the like. Um, here too, I'm skeptical about whether and how quickly uh, the Fed will move in this direction. So the Federal Reserve System, like almost every other central bank on the planet, uh, is studying uh, the possibility. And what a lot of those central banks are concluding, if you read what they write, is that it's possible that there might be modest benefits of moving in the direction of a central bank digital currency, greater uh, convenience in transactions for some people, more financial inclusion for other people who find the fees and conditions attached to private bank accounts too costly, um, but those modest benefits are dominated by the uncertainties and risks. I think the fundamental problem from the point of view of the Federal Reserve is that uh, a, a Federal Reserve digital dollar, a, a payment system where people were using digital dollars to clear all their payments through Federal Reserve banks would be a rich target for hackers and for terrorists. What we have now in the United States, what most countries have, is uh, a, a, a more decentralized payments and payment system where we clear our payments through thousands of different banks using debit cards. They're using our credit cards through 
uh, the credit card companies using a growing variety of online platforms that you will be familiar with. So hackers and terrorists can conceivably take one of those down, but there are many others that are still up and running, presumably, and uh, that means that a, a hacker can't take down the entire U.S. Uh, uh, payment system by uh, uh, going after an, uh, uh, an individual target. So my conclusion is more likely than not this, this uh, ain't going to happen in the United States. China is where it very much uh, uh, will happen, I think. The People's Bank of China, the central bank there, is confident about its ability to maintain the security of its central bank digital currency. Uh, it's already uh, overseeing the two big online payment systems, Alipay and WeChat Pay, which now have to route their payments through the central bank, which therefore has oversight over uh, all those payments. The PBOC is planning to roll out its own digital wallet or token maybe as soon as this year. Will it uh, work? It's not clear that if folks have the choice of transacting with Alipay or transacting with uh, the new People's Bank of China system, they'll prefer the latter. Maybe the PBOC can regulate Alipay, if not of out of business, then maybe out of luck and cause people to shift toward the central bank system. We will see. Another question is whether this kind of thing will work internationally. So one of the advantages of the dollar is that everybody uses it in a wide variety of different countries for cross-border transactions. That's what the Chinese want to do as well, encourage cross-border use, use in other countries of their currency, the renminbi. And they see the digital renminbi as a device to that end. Um, I saw a survey, and on this observation I will conclude, of merchants in South Korea.